really wanted to talk to you guys about tonight, and you'll see how this ties into the theme in just a moment, is how to create good interactive stories. Uh, because when it's done right, the choices can actually fold into the narrative, make the story more engaging, uh, mix it together with a couple of other elements, as you see images, music, narration, and it can add up to something that's a lot greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, now, it's a bit abstract for me to just stand up here and talk about this stuff, so instead, I would like to demonstrate by playing a little game together. Uh, so, if we have this app queued up, there we go. So, options are going to appear on the screen, and all I want you to do is shout out which one you want. We're going to do this as a voice vote, um, and now I've never actually done this in front of a live audience, so this could either go really well, or it could blow up in my face. Okay, <laughs> go well, voice vote. Go well, yes! Go well! Blow up in my face. Yeah. Blow up in my face. <laughs> How unfortunate, thought Lucas in his dramatic narrator voice, but not entirely unexpected. They were testing the system, trying to break it. But in this case, the joke was on them. Lucas had predicted the audience's betrayal and decided to take a little preemptive revenge. Just before coming on stage, he had released into the theater an entire crate of Australian bulldog ants. <laughs> ah, but revenge wasn't the only thing on Lucas's mind. The first rule of interactive storytelling is to give the player a clear, immediate goal and it doesn't get more clear or immediate than not being eaten alive by killer ants. Who wants to stay still? Okay, who wants to raise their feet? Raise feet! Raise the feet. The audience instinctively raised their feet. A smart course of action had these been typical Texas fire ants, but these were Australian bulldog ants, which are capable of jumping up to a meter when agitated. And for an ant, a theater full of human legs suddenly springing into action tends to excite one's mandibles. Who wants to swap the ants? Yeah. Who wants to pour Order drinks on the ants? Order. 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 The audience sprang into action as if the entire group was being controlled by a singular hive mind. When they all poured their drinks onto the floor, the only thing that washed to the front of the theater was popcorn. There were no ants. A wave of relief washed over them, but was quickly replaced by an even worse realization. They were trapped inside an interactive story with an unreliable narrator. Ooh. Who wants to get out of here? Who wants to fight? Okay. The audience rushed the stage, but as they tackled Lucas to the floor and beat him mercilessly, his narrator voice continued, echoing in their minds as if they had never left their seats. One woman had the distinct feeling that she was still sitting towards the back of the theater. Perhaps this was just another one of Lucas's tricks? Was this all in her head? Maybe they had never attacked him at all. No the thought spread through the audience like wildfire, their collective illusion shattering as they realized that they were indeed still in their seats. Trapped as if years of Alamo Drafthouse pre-shows had conditioned them against causing a scene in the middle of a show. I'm going to die in here, thought someone towards the back. Did I just feel an ant? wondered another. He's putting thoughts in our heads, shouted a high school English teacher. This entire story is written in third-person omniscient. Ooh. Anyone not know what third-person omniscient is? Want to pony up to that one? Who says she's right? She's right. She's right. They're catching on, thought Lucas. Third-person omniscient was also known as the God Perspective because it can jump between characters and even go inside their minds to hear their thoughts. But in interactive fiction, it also allows the writer to inject thoughts into the player's mind, simply by saying that a character within the story is already thinking it. Ooh. Who likes dark magic? Yes. Dark magic? Get out of my head? Sounds like get out of my head, demon. The audience tried to not let this monster get the better of them, but as they wrestled against it, Stephen, a former philosophy student in the third row, came to a startling realization. If Lucas can inject thoughts into any character, then he can turn us all against each other. 
This story won't end until all but one of us is dead. It was an insane bit of logic, the sort of thing that under normal circumstances, a theater full of people would probably discuss before brutally murdering each other. But in this case, it wasn't something that had been presented for debate. It was something that Stephen had thought. And because his train of thought had taken place in third-person omniscient perspective, now everyone else was thinking it too. Okay, just shout it out. Thunderdome. Yeah. It was pandemonium from the moment four options appeared on screen. Suddenly faced with so many different choices, the audience had been torn against itself, reinforcing the sense of chaos that Lucas was hoping for. In the commotion, someone grabbed his laptop and gasped at what they saw. The diagram on screen showed the story map written with the open source tool Twine. Every time a decision was made, the paths branched. But there were only a few places where the story split, and the threads immediately folded back in on themselves like a braid. If Lucas had more time, he probably would have created divergent paths and multiple endings. But it wasn't a complex story structure that made this interesting. It was what the choices added to the experience. In fact, this story was so simple that it was immediately clear there was only one way it could end. It is it. The story had become too meta. Lucas had <laughs> dove headfirst into the biggest cliche in interactive fiction, the cardinal rule he swore he'd never break. Don't make interactive fiction about interactive fiction. <laughs> pretty bad. Oh yeah, we said to finish it. Disparate threads and overcomplicated plot twists collapsed under their own weight. People stopped fighting as alternate realities collided, and the audience woke up to find themselves sitting back in the theater, with the overwhelming sense of gassiness that often accompanies interdimensional travel. As they decided whether to applaud or boo, a few people glanced around their seats, just to make absolutely sure there were no ants. Utah over there, actually. Just waiting. Good. Oh, yeah. No waiting. Any other? Taking this, you taking this to South by this year? Uh, no. I, I wrote the, I did this yesterday. Oh, the game. Uh, no, it's it's available now. Uh, like I said, if anyone wants to check it out, there's actually a version of it that doesn't require the Merge Cube. We just launched it uh, this week. So if you have an iPad at 57 North, just Google it. It's about an hour long. It does have a lot of different branching stuff, but having done this, I grew up loving interact or just that interactive story thing, and I wanted to do something like that. And yeah, it's a much, much bigger thing than what you saw here, but there's so much that could be done with it that I think we've barely scratched the surface. Yeah. Oh, one more, one more question. Yeah. Did Johnny do those illustrations yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Jan Johnny is amazing, very fast. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, Lance kind of last minute had to had to bail out, and luckily we were between a couple of projects. We've done this sort of thing with 57 degrees north, so we had all the engine. But yeah, it 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 took us yesterday to basically throw it all together. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah.